Uh, you know, a few days ago, we had some of our awesome volunteers finally wrapping up our failed ice rink this year down in our lower field. I don't know if anybody saw that. Um, but, uh, you know, at the beginning of the season, we had all kinds of hope for this ice rink. And I got to tell you, for myself personally, I had dreams of our whole community being here every night, sipping hot chocolate, maybe even kind of breaking out into song and joining hands like the peanuts, you know, <laughs> like the... Charlie Brown Christmas, kind of skating out there, and uh, that didn't happen. In fact, we didn't skate at all, right? Weather didn't cooperate, and uh, you know, at the start of the winter, we had so much optimism, and the expectations were high, and then winter actually came. And, and I think we all understand that at the beginning of something, there's always optimism, and there's always excitement. You dream about what could be. You know, often it's exciting, and, and I, you, know, you know that I'm a Blue Jays fan, and we've got opening day coming this week, and I know there's lots of great stuff happening in the city in terms of sports. We've got playoffs starting soon. That's exciting. Um, but you know that, you know, at the beginning of the season, all I can think about is World Series, baby, right, when it comes to the Jays. And then the season starts, and they're one in four, and that's sports, right? And, and there's something about this, the, the kind of expectations that we have that can actually motivate us, they can kind of push us forward at times, they can bring us hope and excitement, but they can also create tension. Because when we have high expectations about something going to happen in a certain way, and when the reality is that they don't measure up, there's frustration, and there's disappointment, and there's discouragement. In fact, when I do uh, marriage prep, one of the things we talk about uh, all the time is expectations. And we recognize that the larger the gap between your expectations and reality, the more conflict, the more struggle, the more difficulty. You know, today is Palm Sunday, and we heard the account this morning of Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And for those of us who have heard this story before, you know, maybe you can remember, I, I, this is kind of a long time ago, but you remember there used to be felt boards and little pieces of paper cutouts of the different characters in the story, and our Bible school teachers would stick them up on the board and tell the story along with us. And, and when I think of this story, one of the things that catches my attention often is wondering how on earth the crowd that could be so excited about Jesus' entrance one day be similar to the crowd just a week later screaming, crucify him. The crowd that had completely rejected him only days later. And, and, and for me, it's one of those things that just doesn't make sense. And, and we try to wrap our heads around it. What, what would take a group of people who were excited about Jesus one moment to reject him entirely? And, and the answer, I think, is very simple. The answer is all about expectations. You see, we read from Mark's account uh, this morning, but, but there's other accounts. In fact, every gospel describes this incredible story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And in Matthew's account, at the end of this entire story, there's this profound question in Matthew 21. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he has just come in, the crowds have been shouting Hosanna, and the whole city was stirred, and they asked, who is this? And this is a profound question. It's an important question, especially for us as we come to Palm Sunday. Who is this? You see, by this point, Jesus had, had drawn a big crowd. There were all kinds of people who were following him around. You know, people were curious, and, and so they were trying to get close to him, and so they, he was being crowded out, and so the size of the crowd is not all that surprising. Jesus was someone who was performing miracles. He was saying remarkable things. He was intriguing. He was wise. He was a great teacher. He showed incredible compassion. He was revolutionary in his thinking, and yet he was also ultimately completely rejected. You see, if we um, fast forward to Easter morning, after the resurrection, there's this incredible story of Jesus who had appeared to two people as they were walking along a road, and their shoulders were slumped over, and they were sad. They were just disheartened over everything that had happened. And Jesus, without them knowing, strikes up a conversation with them, and he says, tell me, why are you so sad? And they said, well, you must be new here because things have really been happening over the last couple of days. You see, there was this person, Jesus. And they say in, in, in Luke chapter 24, it says, he was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. You see, what, what took them from all this excitement on one, on one hand to this place of complete rejection on the other 
were expectations of something that just didn't happen the way that they thought it might. And so that gap caused confusion, that gap caused disheartenment, that gap uh, caused all kinds of um, disillusionment as well. We had hoped, but he was killed. We had high expectations, but they didn't measure up. We were there when he came into Jerusalem. You know, maybe one of those guys, I was shouting along, Hosanna, save us, but it didn't turn out the way that we had expected. He was crucified. So let's go back to the moment where Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. He's entering into the city, and he didn't try to lower their expectations, by the way. If anything, he actually began to raise them. You see, when Jesus told his disciples to go and find this colt, and part of the story, he tells them to go and find this, this donkey, and, and he's not just getting tired. What's happening is he wants to make a statement. And, and we often have this humble image of Jesus riding into Jerusalem with his feet kind of almost touching the ground as he rides. And, and this was significant. He, on the one hand, it was extremely lowly. But on the other hand, Jesus wasn't actually showing just humility. He was showing something incredible. He was actually making a statement about who he truly was. He was fulfilling this prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. that says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king has come to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, in the context of this prophecy in Zechariah, God's people had been scattered. Jerusalem had fallen, and, and they were beginning to kind of make their way back to this great city, thinking about what it could have been or what it might have been. And, and they're looking around and recognizing that, that, that everything that they thought was going to happen wasn't happening anymore. And, and Zechariah wanted to encourage those people, and so he shared this incredible prophecy and what he was saying is that, is that this king was coming and he was going to be victorious and you were going to win. In the end, it's winning. I mean, it's something that, that, that God has kind of planned. He's going to bring this king and here he comes riding on a donkey. And so this whole idea is about victory and it's about power and it's about, um, you know, just the, the incredible plan of God unfolding. And it wasn't just about his entrance. See, God chose this exact moment for Jesus to enter the city. And what we know about the moment is that it was the beginning of Passover. You know, people, uh, as he was coming into the city that day, the whole place was bustling with activity and people were getting ready and making preparations. People were, were getting their Passover lambs ready. They were welcoming family who had been traveling from a long way. And so there was this bustling that was going on in the city. But more than that, they were celebrating Israel's deliverance from Egypt and so what they were celebrating was victory and, and God intervening on behalf of his people. And so there's these, these themes of deliverance and all of these kind of things that are sort of kind of bubbling under the surface. And then, and then Jesus chooses the donkey to show his power and he comes marching into Jerusalem. Just imagine the conversa conversations that would have been happening among people. There's the guy, there's Jesus. He's riding on a donkey. Does that remind you? And, and the conversation would start, and so the bustling continues, and all of a sudden, we sort of get what's going on. We, Jesus was cementing his identity as Savior and King. He was a powerful answer to the struggle of his people. You know, the closest followers of Jesus were there. The, the larger crowd of his admirers were there. The whole city of Jerusalem was curious. They asked, who is this? And listen, whether this is your first Easter season as a follower of Jesus, or maybe it's your 81st, you know, taking time to consider our expectations when it comes to Jesus is so important because those people who are holding the palm branches weren't the only ones who had expectations about Jesus. And when there's a gap between our expectations and reality, we can often become frustrated and get discouraged. It was this gap that caused the crowd there in Jerusalem to move from excitement and praise to completely rejecting their Savior. And let's look at a couple of their expectations. You see, Jesus' closest followers actually expected that their relationship with Jesus would bring them some power and prestige. You see, Jesus knew what was coming. If we back up a little bit in Mark chapter 10, Jesus knew what was happening. He was, he was um, you know, talking to his disciples even before it happened, explaining to them, but they didn't seem to get it because, you know, they're, they're sort of saying, okay, Jesus, yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it. Okay, here's a question. And so, you know, two of the disciples kind of pulled Jesus aside right in this moment, and Jesus had just explained what he was about to do. And then in this moment, they say, so, you know, when the kingdom comes, can I sit on your right hand? And, and you know, can I be one of those second in charge? 
And, and so for them, all of a sudden, they're thinking about the power and prestige. I mean, these guys were coming from very lowly backgrounds, and, and, and they were probably kind of people who were looked down on in many cases for those disciples. Just imagine them marching into the city with Jesus riding on a donkey, and they're standing there pumping up their chests, recognizing that, hey, I'm something here. <laughs> And yet Jesus, in the midst of all of this, when, when they were having this conversation about who was the greatest, right before Jesus came into the, uh, Jerusalem in Mark chapter 10, he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many." You see, they had these expectations of becoming rich and famous, and Jesus told them instead that it was about servanthood, and ultimately it was about suffering. Instead of finally being respected and honored, they were forced to run and hide as the crucifixion began. You see, God's plan was bigger, but it wasn't expected, so instead of celebrating, the people eventually rejected him. But those following Jesus also expected that he would relieve their suffering and solve their political problems. And so God made this, this covenant with King David, and we can read about it in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that, that, he, that through David he would establish a kingdom forever. And, and notice what the crowd was cheering when Jesus arrived. It said in verse 9, um, it says, Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. See, they knew exactly what was going on. Their expectation was that a kingdom was going to be set up. And, and, and you know, we have this idea of people lining the roads with their palm branches, so excited about Jesus entering the city. Have you ever thought about where they thought that Jesus might go? You know, because they probably had to get there early and line the route. I bet some of them were lining a route that went directly to the palace where Herod was. Because if Jesus is going to come in and he's going to establish himself as a king, he's got to get to the palace. And so in he comes and the crowd is cheering and all of a sudden he makes a left turn and goes right towards the temple. And the people are saying, Jesus, you're going the wrong way. The palace is over here. we got to go see Herod. This is the time. The time is now. Instead, Jesus goes to the temple. Because he did come to save them, but not from the Romans. He came to save them from themselves. And, and, and by the way, he didn't just come to save the Jews. He also came to save the Romans too. You see, God's plan was bigger, but it wasn't expected. So instead of celebrating, the people ultimately rejected him. See, Jesus didn't come for the sole purpose of making life easier or to take away sickness or the hardship that we face day to day, even in the Passover itself. I mean, they were celebrating this incredible move of God when he took his people out. He intervened and he took his people out of Egypt. But remember, he didn't just take them out and put them right in this land flowing with milk and honey. Because of their decisions, he took them out and they still had to wander through the desert for 40 years. You see, Jesus didn't just simply come to make life easier. He came so that we could have hope. He came so that we could have peace. Instead of providing escape, Jesus came to provide that hope. And for the people that first Palm Sunday, it only took a few days to realize that their expectations about him becoming the king just weren't materializing the way they'd expected. And it was also happening so quickly. And with the crucifixion happening and everything that went on, they just lost hope and they lost heart. Today, we're preparing for a week that changed the course of human history. Every single step that Jesus made as he entered into Jerusalem for that last time was carefully planned and calculated. The whole city was curious. So as we prepare for Easter, you know, this would be a good time to check in on our expectations about Jesus. Because when we find that gap between our expectations and reality, it becomes discouraging. It can become quite frustrating. And maybe, you know, you're here this morning and you're thinking, like, I'm following Jesus and I have stepped out to do something really, really hard and it's not getting any easier. I thought that things would turn around when I started taking the right steps. Or maybe you're thinking that, you know, I just was hoping that things would change for me financially. Or maybe, you know, you've been trying to find a Christian to date and you've been thinking, you know, I thought I'd find somebody by now and, and I'm trying to do it the right way, but I'm still struggling. 
Or maybe, you know, you thought when you started spending more time with God that maybe those habits and hang-ups and things that you thought that you would just leave behind are still hanging around and you can't let go of them. You know, maybe you can see change in other people and you're discouraged that you aren't seeing that same kind of change in your own life. Maybe, you know, you were convinced that God was pointing you in a direction and saying, this is, you know, I want you to step away from your career and start something brand new, and you've stepped away from your career and faith, and, and yet it just seems to be kind of not going as expected. The stability's gone, and things just aren't working out. You see, when we have these ideas in our minds about what the difference that following Jesus should make in our lives, when they don't happen the way that we expect, that's the gap. That's what can become discouraging. You see, the people wanted Jesus to take his role as king, but they had a different way of seeing him accomplish that. Listen, I can tell you that there are people who no longer come to our church or any church because that gap was just too wide. You probably know people yourself who faced difficulty and their expectations about a new life in Christ were, were up here and reality just didn't quite measure up to what they were expecting. And it's heartbreaking. But let me be clear, when Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, he wasn't lowering expectations. The response is not to lower our expectations at all, but it is possible that we need to shift our expectations. Just a little bit. And I just want to point out two things that we can expect as we look at Jesus and as we consider his life and how it intersects with ours. The first thing I think we need to expect is to be surprised by Jesus. And I don't mean that Jesus is unpredictable or that Jesus is changing. We know that God is entirely consistent. But Jesus surprised the people that he encountered from the religious leaders right down to the poor and the undervalued because his message was so different. He surprised people at the extent of his compassion when he reached out and touched the sick, when he came alongside those who were completely undervalued in society. He surprised people by his teaching when he began to talk about things like sacrifice and generosity and grace. He surprised people by his power when he was able to calm the storm, when he was able to, to calm the, 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 like nature itself. See, Jesus is worth exploring. He will surprise you. And for those of us who have been in church for a long time, he's worth exploring again because sometimes we can get caught in these patterns of thinking that can cause us to get stuck. And you probably know, um, you probably know this even in your own life because sometimes we expect God to solve one problem or one area in our life and, and we let him in and all of a sudden he goes in a different direction. And it's almost like the same picture of Jesus entering into Jerusalem when we say, you know, there's something in my life and finally I'm just going to let it go. It's that addiction or it's that problem. And it's like, Jesus, come on into my life. Go right over here. And Jesus says, actually, I want to, what's that over there? I want to fix that. You see, when we are prepared to be surprised by Jesus, he may start looking at things in our life that need to change that perhaps we haven't even thought of yet. You see, that's the incredible thing about who Jesus is, is that he's constantly kind of moving in ways that, that are surprising to us. Even the whole story of the cross, God's grace, I mean, it's surprising all in itself. Jesus demonstrates that what we he, he, he actually dismantles what we believe about being good and about being deserving, all of those things, and, 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 inter and grace comes in instead. When we expect Jesus to surprise our thinking, we actually begin to close the gap on what we expect and what reality is. But also, I think we need to expect to find a Savior in Jesus. And that's the second thing, expect to find a Savior in him. You know, the people who shouted Hosanna, which means literally save or save us, Jesus was clearly there in Jerusalem to save his people, to free his people, and to forever change the course of history. But he wasn't there to simply make life easy. He was there to make life more hopeful, and he was there to make life more peaceful. And listen, as we turn our attention to the cross that you see behind me uh, this week and then to Easter, are you truly expecting a Savior? And here's what it means. If we, if we expect Jesus as Savior, it means that we're going to acknowledge that we need help. And that, and that says two things. It means, number one, we recognize that there's a problem. We recognize that there's something going on in our life that we just can't fix ourselves. And the second thing is 
that we can't do anything about it. You know, I don't often get too excited. Sometimes people, when people come to me and they say, oh, can you believe what this person did? Or can you believe this? And the truth is, you know, the sin and evil in our world is just an example that we need Jesus. Those things, the horrific things that we see around the world serve to point us to the only answer, the Savior. It also, um, it means that we need to acknowledge that God has a plan. And Jesus, as he entered into Jerusalem, had this plan to save, um, to save us. This started at Jesus' birth, and it comes right through to the event that we look forward to on Easter. And listen, there are some of us who aren't really expecting Jesus as a Savior. We're not expecting him um, to, to fill that role. You know, he might, you might be thinking he was a good guy, he was an amazing teacher. But when we expect Jesus just to be a good teacher, you know, when we start to dig in, we begin to find some things, some really hard things that he said. And then all of a sudden, there begins to be a gap. And when we expect Jesus just to be a compassionate person, a good person, someone that we can follow, a good example to look up to, you know, he might be uh, someone who would inspire a bracelet like WWJD. But in the end, if he's just an example, then he doesn't have the power to change us. When we're expecting a savior, we find one. So this week, as we get closer to Easter, you know, I just want to encourage you to check um, your expectations. Who are you looking for? What do you expect when Jesus comes into your life? Let's pray. God, I thank you that you care about the details of our lives. Um, I thank you that you uh, instruct us, that you empower us, that you encourage us you inspire us. God, I thank you for your incredible example of um, those moments when you came into Jerusalem uh, and, and as Jesus rode this donkey, the symbol of kingship and also humility. God, I pray that we would, uh, we would shift our expectations to a place that would recognize the incredible things that you want to do in our lives. And I pray as we come to this uh, season of Easter that we'd be reminded uh, of your incredible sacrifice and we would just be filled with joy and we'd be filled uh, with hope and we'd be filled with peace, uh, recognizing, God, that it's only you uh, that can accomplish this for us. So we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.